Okay, we're going to get going, and the good news is we've had about 30 people sign up to visit the cores or the tumor boards. So this is the last day that you can sign up, and if anyone in the class wants to, I brought some sheets. You can just get them from me and fill them out. And we're sort of switching the schedule. Our first lecture today is Jill Smith. She was a professor at Penn State, and then she came to NIH for a year, and now she's a professor of medicine at Georgetown. She's going to discuss translational research, bench-to-bedside clinical trials. Jill. Thank you. Okay. How many of you in the audience are PhDs, working on PhDs? How many MDs? Okay, and others are students or RNs or, huh, staff? Okay, well, okay. So I do have a couple disclosures that I'd like to say. I'm an inventor on a few patents, and some of them I might mention some of the work here. And I also um, am, a, am a director for a consulting firm, and I help companies get drugs developed. So. Um, the objectives of what I'm going to discuss today is first to un how to understand, to take an idea from the research lab to patient care. Learn the steps on how you conduct a clinical trial and comprehend some of the obstacles that we have in overcome for drug development. And then I'm going to give you some examples that I've had from my experience with translational pro projects and then the pitfalls and the prize. So, First of all, we all have dreams. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have a dream, you know? I want to cure cancer. I want to find the cure for AIDS. I want the Nobel Prize. You know, that was always my dream. I wanted to get the Nobel Prize. And we all have dreams. And of course, Nelson Mandela talked about how there's no easy walk to freedom anywhere. And then you have to go through these difficulties in the valley of the shadow of death again and again and before we reach our mountaintop desires. Edmund Hillary, who was the first person that summited Mount Everest, had a quote, and he stood there before a beautiful picture of Mount Everest, and when he had failed, the first time he tried to ascend Mount Everest, all of his people and his team died, and he came back and he spoke to the parliament or whatever, and he turned and he looked at the picture and he said, Mount Everest, you have defeated me, but I will return and I will defeat you because you can't get any bigger, but I can. And then, of course, Martin Luther King, he has the dream, you know, the dream, his great speech about the dream. So we all have dreams and aspirations about where we want to be, what we want to do, or you wouldn't be here at the NIH studying and learning more. So my talk is going to be about research and drug development and translational research. And, and of course, there's tons of research that's going on in the preclinical arena. And the problem is, is that in spite of all these, these research uh, projects going on, very few of them actually make it all the way into clinical trials. So there's this bottleneck, and things get weeded out for one reason or another. Or is the real bottleneck, I'm not supposed to really say this at a federal facility, is it Washington? You know, is it the political problems? We can't get funding. There's not enough money for research, whatever. So where is the bottleneck, really? So if we had more money, we could do more research, right? So first of all, the first thing you need to get started in your research project, and I presume all of you are working on different research areas, is you have to have an idea. You have to have a hypothesis. And then you have to decide what is the problem that's at hand? What needs to be done to solve this problem? And can, how can your research change the problem? So the last thing that you have to have is you got to have passion for what you're doing. If you don't like what you're doing, do something else. I mean, you really have to have a passion. You got to like your gene is the gene that's going to change the world. You know, you have a protein that you know is going to make a difference in someone's life. You have to have a passion about what you're doing. So, okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the different phases of clinical trials. And most trials go through, for new drugs, go through a series of steps. 
First of all, how many of you are working in a research lab with cells and animals and things like that? So that's in the preclinical phase, okay? And those are all just as important for research. That's where it all starts. So we work with cells in, in culture, with animals, in vivo experiments. And then once we go beyond the animals, then we want to take it to human trials. And then we go through four different phases. Phase one, two, three, and four. And so, and there's different types of trials. We have treatment trials, prevention trials, early detection, diagnostic, genetics, and quality of life, and so on. So first, the phase one trial is usually the first in human when you're going from your animal to human. And it's not a lot of people. And the whole purpose of a phase one trial is to determine, is the compound that you're going to use safe? How toxic is it? And then you want to know how should it be given? Do you have to give it intravenously because it's a protein and it's going to be degraded if you take it orally? You have to study the pharmacokinetics. How long does it last? What's the half-life once you infuse your compound? And then what is the toxicity, the treatment effects on the body? So that's what the, the outcome should be of your phase one trial. It's not does it work or doesn't work. It's is it safe? The phase two trial is actually efficacy, doesn't really do anything. So, and it, usually the first phase two trial is not a whole lot of people, but you have to have a primary endpoint. Most phase two trials are done unbiased, meaning they're blinded fashion. Um, and then you want to know, does it work? So you might compare your compound to a placebo to see if you get a better effect. Sometimes in cancer treatments, we compare it to standard treatment. Rather, we don't want to put our cancer patients on a placebo. So then a phase three trial is usually hundreds to thousands of people. And you want to have, see if there's an equal chance to be assigned to one group or the other. So you want your groups to be very comparable. And the purpose of this is to determine how the new treatment compares to either the current treatment or to a placebo. And these trials are usually done as a superiority trial. Yes, our drug is more superior than the standard of treatment, or a non-inferiority trial, meaning that it's, it's the same, but maybe it costs less. So there's reasons for doing non-inferiority trials. But you have to decide at the onset of your protocol design what type of trial it's going to be so that you can reach your outcome. And then lastly, there's phase four trials, which are hundreds to thousands of people. And this is, for example, like a vaccination. Once a vaccination gets approved, if we get a vaccination for Ebola, it's going to go into big clinical trials. And they're going to, like the hepatitis B vaccinations, it was years later in testing to see what was the efficacy of this vaccination and decreasing the outcome you know, of exposure to people with hepatitis B. And that was after it had already been approved. So that's the post-marketing phase of the trial. So when we do trials, we typically do randomized trials, meaning that there's an equal chance to being assigned to one group versus the other. And one group typically gets the most widely accepted or standard treatment, and the other group you know, gets the treatment that you're going to be testing. And you want the groups to be very similar. So if, if your outcome is going to be based upon a certain blood test, say like a C-reactive protein, you want to make sure when you enroll the people into the study that it's equally balanced, that the people in group A have the same starting level of C-reactive protein as those in group B. Otherwise, you're going to be changing your endpoint. Okay, So this will provide the best way to prove the effectiveness of an agent. And then you can do a small pilot trial Typically, when we have no idea how many patients we need for a sample size, we'll do a pilot trial without even having a placebo just to see, well, does it change the outcome? Uh, does it shrink the tumor? And that gives you a tentative idea of how many people you're going to have to enroll to get your p-value of 0.05 to show that it really is better or not better. So that provides the tentative response rate to estimate your sample size. The other thing you need to keep in mind is whenever we do clinical trials, you're dealing with human subjects. And there's human subject protection offices. And patient rights have to be protected. 
So there's ethical and legal codes that govern our medical practice, and they apply to clinical trials. You have to get an informed consent. The patient has to understand what's going on, um, and they have to comprehend it. Uh, for example, if you have somebody who does not speak the language that your consent is written in, you cannot have a family member interpret it to them because you have to have somebody who is not related to the patient interpret it. So there's all these, these little details that are important. Once you go into the clinical trial, there are review boards. So there's a scientific review for a lot of the cancer studies. And then there's the institutional review board, which will approve or disapprove or ask you to modify your protocol in order to protect the rights of patients. Um, and then once the study starts going, often there's a data safety monitoring board that will be monitoring your study as you go along. And you may not know who's on what treatment, but the safety board will know. And we often have early stopping rules. So for example, if you find treatment A is much better than treatment B, and the people getting treatment B are not surviving as long, the data safety monitoring board may stop the study, an early stopping rule, and make you treat everybody. So that's what a data safety monitor, or if they find that your treatment is causing harm to people, they may stop it early. So that's their job. So the other thing that's very important today, now that we're doing a lot of genetic testing, it's required that you have a paragraph in your consent form if you are going to be keeping patients' blood samples or DNA for possible genetic testing, because that may have outcomes for insurance purposes. And patients have to understand that. Even if you de-identify the data, it has to be placed in the consent form. So how do you do it? What are some of the nuts and bolts of going from your cell culture and mice to going into humans? And I'll just give you some of examples from my experience. Um, my research is primarily with pancreatic cancer. And so pancreatic cancer is the fourth leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States. And the median survival is only three to six months from the time of diagnosis. It is the only cancer that the five-year survival is in the single digits. And most of the cases are not diagnosed early, and there is no effective therapy if it's not surgically treated. So looking at this graph, the incidence of pancreatic cancer is actually on the rise. And this paper that was published in Cancer Research um, on the left-hand side of your screen shows that by the year 2020, pancreatic cancer is going to exceed colorectal cancer and breast cancer to become the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, next to lung cancer, which is Dr. Moody's talk. So. Now, how do we treat pancreatic cancer? Well, shown on this slide is the standard treatment that we have today for advanced pancreatic cancer. And this is, they were both published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And one study involves using fulfurinox, and the other one is uh, gemabraxane. And unfortunately, even with the best that we have today, the survival does not make it out one year. So it's really awful. So we have tried over 70 different chemotherapeutic regimens in pancreatic cancer. We have thrown every toxic agent that we have at pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer is resistant to all of those chemotherapeutic agents. And because of this, Congress has declared pancreatic cancer to be one of the recalcitrant cancers. And of course, asking for more funding to go into this area so that things will change in the future. So, oops. So first of all, with pancreatic cancer, for any of you who are in the lab into cloning, you can't expect to change the outcome of pancreatic cancer if you keep doing the same thing. You got to change your strategy. So I think one of the problems with pancreatic cancer is that in spite of all of our genomics, in spite of all our advanced technology and imaging, survival from pancreatic cancer has not changed in 50 years. 
And one of the reasons I think, here's the beltway, is that, see this guy is going in the wrong direction. So maybe we're going in the wrong direction here. We have to think of other ways and think outside the box. So now you come along and you say, okay, what is the problem? Well, what's the reason why pancreatic cancer prognosis is so poor? Well, there's no method to detect it early. There are no screening tests for people who are at high risk. It's resistant to chemotherapy. And we really don't understand the biology of this cancer. So one of the areas of my research is with G-protein coupled receptors. And one of those G-protein coupled receptors is opioid receptors. And my interest is in opioid receptors as they serve as potent growth regulators. So what increases endogenous opioids, which are your enkephalins and endorphins? Well, there's four main things. One is eating chocolate, especially dark chocolate. I like that one. The other one is exercise. And we all know people get that euphoria from the endorphins that go up if you have a good workout. Um, the other one is a religious experience. And the fourth thing that raises endogenous and keplins and endorphins is actually sex. But that's censored for this talk. So what are the opioid peptides and their receptors? So the endogenous opioids, um, which are enkephalin and endorphins, and I'll refer interchangeably to metenkephalin as OGF, or opioid growth factor, as we call it. They're the ones that are made within us. They're endogenous, and they can cause euphoria and the runner's high. We're all very familiar with synthetic opiates, and that's the pain pills, narcotics, uh, morphine, Demerol, fentanyl. And those medicines are used to treat pain and cause for sedation. Uh, they help diarrhea. So some of my colleagues up at Penn State were looking at metenkephalin, and they found that actually it decreased growth of cancers. And they found that it does this by diffusing into the cells, and it upregulates P16 and P21, which are these cyclin-dependent inhibitory kinases. And when it does that, it binds to the, the nuclear envelope, so it's a nuclear receptor. And in doing so, it decreases DNA synthesis and decreases growth. So it's a negative regulatory peptide. <clears throat> so one of the things we did is we thought, well, we should look at this. My partner, Dr. Zagan, was working in neurotransmission, and that's where he got into the opioids. And I said, well, I wonder what it does to pancreatic cancer. So our hypothesis was that the OGF could inhibit growth of pancreatic cancer because it decreases the DNA and decreases the growth. So we did some preclinical experiments, and we grew pancreatic cancer cells in culture, treated them with the OGF, and we looked to see how it affected growth. And then we also studied the signaling pathways, and we looked at it in an animal model. But to make a long story short, Here's our control pancreatic cancer cells. When we treated them in cell culture with OGF, we inhibited growth. And when we blocked the receptor with an opioid antagonist, we reversed it. So we knew it was a receptor-mediated growth. And we knew that we used a concentration of the antagonist that did not have an effect on growth itself. And then we also did receptor binding assays, and we found that there were indeed OGF receptors on human pancreatic cancer cells. So then we went from cells into mice, and we treated our mice, and you can see they have these really ugly tumors, and we treated them with five milligrams per kilogram of the OGF three times a day to shrink their tumors, and indeed, we could shrink the tumors. So this was really exciting. But then we wanted to say, well, does this work in human beings? So if you're treating a mouse at five milligrams per kilogram three times a day, then you have to calculate how much am I going to give a 70 kilogram person? So there are different methods that you can kind of calculate the dose, and then you reduce it like tenfold. So that's basically what I did. 
So getting back to the hypothesis-driven research, so we have a problem, pancreatic cancer, and the problem is that it's got a terrible prognosis, three months survival. Our hypothesis was that OGF could inhibit the growth of the pancreatic cancer cells in nude mice and in culture, so maybe it would work in humans. So we started with a phase one trial looking at safety and toxicity. But before you get to the phase one trial, you have to get approval from the Food and Drug Administration before you can take a compound that's never been given to humans before and give it to humans, because it's not approved. So you have to apply for what we call an IND, or an investigational new drug number. And in order to do that, you have to fill out these two forms called a 1571 and a 1572. And then you have to have a protocol that will be approved by the FDA that will tell them exactly what you're going to do, what doses you're going to use, how you're going to give it. You have to get your consent form. You have to get approval from the research committee. And of course, you, it's good to find a funding agency that will sponsor your research. That's probably the hardest part. A lot of times, people at this point will go to a company. We were fortunate that I got an NIH grant that supported this. Um, and then there's different responsibilities. And of course, you have to upload your clinical trial before you treat the first patient on the clinicaltrial.gov website. Otherwise, you cannot publish your results. So that's mandatory. So there's a website that you have to go to, and that's where patients can search for what trials are out there. This is just a copy of the 1571 form, and it has to be submitted. You have to put your IND number. Every time you communicate with the FDA and you send in a revised protocol or anything, you have to send in another copy of this form. So this just happened to be uh, my IND number for the OGF. And you have to put in here the serial number of this is the first time I'm submitting this application, so this happens to be serial number one. The next time I communicate with the FDA, it's going to be serial number number two, and so forth. So, um, and then you have to say what you're submitting on this report. This is a new protocol. This is a revised protocol, and you tell them what you're doing. So then what were the aims of our phase one study? Well, we wanted to look at the safety and toxicity of giving OGF to humans. I wanted to know what dose to use. What's the maximum tolerated dose before I got to toxicity? And I wanted to study some of the pharmacokinetics. Uh, how is it metabolized? Is it taken? Do you see it? If, can we measure it in the blood? And what's the best route of administration? Now, I know it's a peptide, so I couldn't give it orally. But we were going to try giving it intravenously as well as subcutaneously. So the first thing we did is I calculated, based upon the mice, a tentative dose, and then I backed that down and came up with this dose for humans of 25 uh, micrograms per kilogram. And this is a classic, what we call dose escalation, three by three study design. So you enter three patients at the top at the lowest dose, and then you look for any toxicity. If there's no toxicity, then you go on up to the next dose. If there's no toxicity, you go on up to the next dose, and so forth. But then if you do have a toxic event, then you have to enter three more at that dose. Or if you have two toxic events, you can't go any further. So that's the typical way of doing it. So we started at 25. And I will say that the first patient that I treated with pancreatic cancer uh, ended up in the hospital that weekend with abdominal pain. And I had to make a decision whether it was due to my treatment or was it due to her cancer. And it wasn't a, uh, it was a known side effect of pancreatic cancer. So I went ahead and treated the other two patients and they did just fine. But you know, I could have possibly said, oh no, I'm not gonna go any further. But um, I went ahead, and actually, that was at 25, and we ended up going all the way up to 250 micrograms per kilogram before we reached toxicity. So that was our MTD, or maximum tolerated dose. We also measured blood levels, and we measured them after giving it subcutaneously and intravenously. And we could actually get higher blood levels if we gave it subcutaneously, but the patients were having to inject themselves a couple times a day. 
and I just didn't have the heart for that. So we ended up giving it in our study by an infusion over 30 minutes. So after we did our phase one trial and we looked at safety and toxicity, and we also did chronic treatment with that to make sure it was safe, then we moved on to the phase two trial. And we did the phase two trial at the dose that we had determined was the best dose in the phase one trial. Um, the, we did it first as an open labeled study and then we had a sample size based upon what we did in the phase one trial, I knew how many patients I needed to have. I needed to have at least 50 subjects to be treated and we ended up having 166 control patients. So we treated patients who had unresectable pancreatic cancer. Now the caveat to this study was that I went round and round with the FDA. I would have loved to have compared it to standard treatment, but they said, you can't do that because we don't know if your compound works or doesn't work, and you might be preventing someone from getting a possible therapy that could be useful, even though we know those treatments don't work. So they made me treat people who had already failed therapy which if you know pancreatic cancer, by the time you fail therapy, you're already close to the end. But that was the best we could do. But, so we did this study and we compared it to people, people who had failed therapy, they had the option to enroll in the study or not get any treatment. So we had a, a control group of people and they were equally balanced. And so we looked at survival, we looked at the time to progression, we looked at the clinical benefit and quality of life in these patients. And we looked at CAT scans, and we actually found that many patients who were on this study uh, had stabilization of their disease or decrease in the size of their tumors. And what we found was when we looked at survival that our OGF-treated patients had significantly increased survival compared to the untreated patients. So this is a phase two trial. It's efficacy, and yes, it does have some effect on pancreatic cancer. So, so that's one compound. Now another area of G protein coupled research that I, I do is with cholecystokinin receptors or CCK receptors. And uh, CCK receptors are the classic G protein coupled receptors. They're a seven transmembrane spanning receptor. And the primary ligands that bind to these receptors are cholecystokinin and gastrin. So there are three different types of cholecystokinin receptors, and I don't know how many of you have had GI physiology, but if you haven't, I'll just review it for you. The A receptor was originally called the A receptor because it was found in the alimentary tract, and it has greater affinity for CCK than gastrin, and it's in the mouse pancreas. The B receptor was originally found in the brain by Dr. Stephen Wank, who's here in NIDDK. He cloned this receptor. So he's the one that discovered this. And it's the main receptor that's in the stomach and in the human pancreas. And it has an equal affinity for the two ligands, CCK and gastrin. And then there's the CCKC receptor that my lab discovered. And it's a splice variant of the B receptor that occurs only in cancer. And it has a greater affinity for gastrin than for CCK. <clears throat> and we started looking at human pancreatic cancer cells and compared them to a normal pancreas. And again, this is back to the lab. And what we found was that pancreatic cancers uh, markedly overexpressed the CCKB receptor. And these, these cancers are listed in order of how differentiated they are. So PANC1 cells are the most poorly differentiated, and they have the most number of receptors compared to here's the normal human pancreas. And when we took these cells in cell culture and we treated them or applied CCK or gastrin in cell culture, we found that we could stimulate the growth of the cancer cells. So another interesting thing is gastrin, which is one of the ligands that binds to the CCK receptor, is normally present in the fetal pancreas and where it aids in growth and differentiation, but it's shut off at week 14 in both humans and in mice. And then it's not re-expressed again until early precancerous lesions. And what we found is we looked at normal pancreas and we looked at all these pancreatic cancer cell lines 
and one of these is messenger RNA for gastrin, and the other one is peptide. And we found that gastrin becomes reactivated and is overexpressed in pancreatic cancer. Oops. And what we found here is this is gastrin staining by immunohistochemistry. And when we looked at our, our human pancreatic cancer cell lines, what we found was when we grew them as tumors in nude mice, their growth rate was directly proportional to how much gastrin that they made. So gastrin is one of the drivers of pancreatic cancer, and it does so by stimulating the CCKB receptor. And so we thought, okay, so what happens if we get rid of gastrin? Will the cancer cells still grow? So we did, we measured, uh, we did knockdown experiments with antisense, and we also did some stable clones with shRNAs, and we knocked down gastrin, and this is just showing that it's knocked down by QRT-PCR. And when we tried to grow the knockdown to uh, clones in cells, we found that those that had greater than 90% knockdown of the gastrin did not form tumors. Those that had like 70% knockdown still formed some tumors, but the growth was delayed. So this is the normal wild type. And so if you knock out gastrin, you can slow down the growth of pancreatic cancer. So that's easy to say that you can do an siRNA in the test tube, but how are you going to use that to treat human beings? So one of the projects that I'm working on with the guys at the National Nano Characterization Lab up in Frederick is we've designed some nanoparticles, and nanoparticles can protect the siRNA. We can put it inside these nanoparticles, and we can deliver the siRNA safely to the tumor so it won't be digested in the blood by the RNases that we have. The other thing that we can do is we can make these nanoparticles so they're target specific and they go directly to the CCK receptor so that it will go just to pancreatic cancer and not to all the other tissues to give you that off-target toxicity like chemotherapy does. And the other thing that we've done is we've put fluorescent probes inside so we can actually look and see where do these nanoparticles end up in the mice when we do it. So just some examples of things that we've been working on. Uh, this is a mouse, and that's actually luciferase activity. The mouse has an orthotopic pancreatic cancer. And we treated these groups of mice. One group got empty liposomes, meaning nothing was inside of them. One group got liposomes that had a scrambled siRNA control. And then the third group down here got the gastrin siRNA. And we injected our mice with these siRNAs, and we found, indeed, we could inhibit the growth of pancreatic cancer by targeting, used, targeting the gastrin and shutting down gastrin. And this was good, but we wanted something a little bit better. So these particles that we used in this experiment were what we called non-targeted. They went anywhere in the mouse. They weren't going directly to the receptor. So we used a different formula, and we conjugated uh, ligand to the nanoparticle so that it would bind to the CCK receptor. The CCK receptor would then internalize, like it normally does, take the siRNA inside, and it would knock down gastrin. And we put the fluorescent probe in them so we would make sure it went to the pancreas. So what you have here on the left is a mouse. These are staples. I operated on the mice and gave them cancer in their pancreas. And then we injected them with the nanoparticles that had the fluorescent probe in them, but they weren't targeted to go to the receptor. And you can see after seven hours, they're kind of scattered throughout here. And, uh, but then after 24 hours, there's really not a whole lot of activity. However, in the particles that we designed that will target the CCK receptor, we found not only at seven hours, but at 24 hours, they stayed in the tumor, in the pancreas. So now we can try to design therapies that will go to the cancer and not have this toxicity effect um, that will hurt other organs. Well, what about using gastrin in human beings? Well, there's, there's a company, um, they're called Cancer Advances. They actually took my idea about knocking down gastrin and they developed a vaccine 
for it. It's already been through six clinical trials, and they found that when they took patients who had pancreatic cancer and they vaccinated them so that they would raise their own antibodies to gastrin to knock out gastrin another way, what they found was that in those people who responded and developed antibodies, their survival was significantly improved, better than the chemotherapy that we're seeing. So if you can, this is proof of principle, if you can knock out the gastrin, which is one of the drivers for pancreatic cancer, and this is hopefully they going before the FDA to get this approved for therapy. So it's based upon basic science research, taking it to clinical trials. So just to review a little bit, there's receptors on normal pancreas, and these receptors, the CCK receptors, will bind CCK or gastrin. And in the normal condition, it releases enzymes to help you digest food. But in cancer, the receptors are overexpressed, and there's even a mutated receptor, which I'll mention in a minute. But then they don't make enzymes. When the receptors are activated, they cause cell growth. And then gastrin gets activated again inside the cells and released into the media where it stimulates growth in an autocrine mechanism. So this is what we call the CCKC receptor. And the CCKC receptor is the third receptor I just wanted to mention to you. Um, years ago when I was just doing RT-PCR and looking at the CCKB receptor in human pancreatic cancer specimens, we found that a large number of the specimens had a larger size PCR product, and I didn't know why. And we ended up finding out that there were some specimens that retained the fourth intron. Now, you know the introns are supposed to be spliced out, and in the wild-type normal CCKB receptor, it is spliced out. But for some reason, in the CCKC receptor, the fourth intron remains there, and we found that this is due to a single nucleotide polymorphism that occurs within intron four. So they, they missed this mutation when they were doing their large exomic GWAS studies because it's an intronic SNP. So, um, and it changes a C to an A, and when that happens, you don't splice out the fourth intron and you get a longer size piece. And the reason why this was never found when people were doing research with mice, this is a plug for why you have to always think about using human tissues, and because not everything is the same. So when you look at humans and you look at the fourth intron here of CCKB, it has 207, which is divisible by three, so you get three codons. But in mouse or rat, it's not divisible by three. And then also down here, if you look at intron four, humans have an open reading frame throughout the fourth intron so that if it's misspliced, you can transcribe it and translate it into protein. However, in rodents, there's a stop codon right in the beginning of intron four, so they never transcribe it. So what happens in humans who have this SNP, and the SNP is actually in 40%, 35 to 40% of people with pancreatic cancer, is that they misplice the fourth intron, and that is translated into a 69 amino acids, and this happens to be within the third intracellular loop of the receptor, the G-protein-coupled receptor, which is the area of the receptor that's involved in GTP binding and cell proliferation. Um, we've raised an antibody, monoclonal antibody, to this. And uh, so why does this happen? So what we have figured out is that in people who have the wild type B receptor and have the C genotype, they have the C allele allows binding of this splicing protein to the pre-messenger RNA, and then you splice out the intron. In people who have the SNP and have the transition from C to A, they do not have the binding of the splicing protein, so they fail to splice out the intron. Well, is this clinically relevant at all? Um, we did a large study 
So this is where you go back and you do studies. And we did a study in 761 patients who had pancreatic cancer, and we genotyped their CCKB receptors, and we wanted to know, and we also looked at their survival. If they had the SNP, did it affect their survival? And indeed it did, because our hypothesis was that because it's in the third intracellular loop and it's driving GTP proteins and proliferation, if you have this, it's going to accelerate the growth of the cancer. And indeed, if you have the SNP, you die very rapidly from the disease. You die very rapidly anyway from pancreatic cancer, but this may contribute to why the survival from pancreatic cancer is so poor, because 35 to 40% of the people have this SNP. Not only is this important, is that you know SNPs are germline mutations, they're not somatic mutations. And because of that, it's possible that we might begin to screen high-risk families for this SNP to see if it may predispose them to get pancreatic cancer. So it does have some clinical relevance. So last thing to mention here, intellectual property. Whenever you're doing research, you know, you have to submit an invention disclosure or some provisional patent. Um, especially if you're going to present the research publicly, including posters. Because once you present it, it's public domain. So just submit something so that they know that you claim this is your work. And then the other thing is, is that the patent belongs to whoever you work for. My OGF patent belonged to Penn State. And, you know, so they get most of the royalties on it, and I get lunch, you know. <laughs> but... Um, once you do this and you make a discovery and you have a patent, then you can assign the rights to a company. And then <clears throat> you license the patent and you try to develop the drug. And, and basically, companies are only going to be really interested in your research if it's patentable, because that's how they're going to make their money. So think about that. You know, of course, we as scientists are more interested in coming up with a discovery and everything, but you have to think about the reality of the things. If you're ever going to get your compound out there and get a company to develop it, they only want to develop it if they have rights. So, so what are some of the obstacles with translational research today? Well, of course, money is always a problem, lack of funds or misuse of funds or disparity of funds. Um, I'm a clinician, and it, it's hard for clinicians to get protected research time. They would rather I be off doing screening colonoscopies than trying to solve pancreatic cancer. So um, there's a big chasm between industry, the NIH, and academia. And, and I know that when I worked here for the NIH, I wasn't allowed to talk to industry. You know, and, and when you're in academia, they have you sign all these disclosures if you're going to talk to industry. Industry doesn't like sharing their ideas with academia and vice versa. We all need to come together. I mean, there's a lot of great ideas that are developed in research labs. And, you know, as long as those can be licensed to companies, they just need to work together so that we can develop these ideas. Um, there's always a problem with trying to recruit patients into studies. Patients often say, oh, am I going to be a guinea pig? You know, that's always one thing they ask. But, you know, I think of all the patients that I've treated, they've all been so satisfied and delighted that they were able to participate in a research study. Even if it didn't help them, they know that they're advancing science. Um, and then the other important issue is that there's no man is an island. There's no more one-man bands. It's all about team science. You know, I couldn't have done this work without having my colleagues who are in chemistry, who are in, you know, the PhDs in the lab, who do the uh, other stuff. We all have to work together. The nanoparticles, I mean, it's a team approach. I bring something to the table, they bring something to the table, and we all have to work together, and that's how we advance science, and we share ideas and we work together. So. In order to cure pancreatic cancer, I say we have to think outside the box. And rather than doing what everybody else has done for the past 50 years, maybe this is really the person that's going in the right direction. And we all need to sit back and think when we're doing our research, you know, it's okay to think outside the box. 
It's those out of the box ideas that change the world and change science. So, and don't be afraid to take some risks. You know, if I had stopped at that first patient who had some abdominal pain when I gave her the first dose of OGF, it wouldn't be going through the FDA right now for approval for treatment. So sometimes you have to take some risks to move forward. And the bottom line is, is does research have any clinical relevance to people? Well, these are some of my patients that I've treated with pancreatic cancer who were just delighted to have their picture taken because they participated in research and it changed their lives. So yes, I mean, for each one of those patients, you know, if I can change one life, it's worth it. So I also want to say don't give up. If I can tell all of you who are starting off, you know, whatever mistakes you make in the lab, I've made every mistake. Um, you know, will I ever get the Nobel Prize? Maybe not, but you know, I hope one of the people I've trained or one of my students will get the Nobel Prize. And it's important that you have to stand up for what you believe in. You, and, and what I say is if you don't believe in yourself or in your dreams, no one else is gonna believe in you either. So you have to believe in what you're doing. You have to have faith in your work and you have to not give up, okay? So I want to give thanks to my lab and, of course, all the animals who gave their lives for my research. And thank you very much. Any questions? Right, so, so the question is, is when is gastrin expressed? And it's expressed in the developing fetus up until about week 14, and then it's shut off and it's not detected at birth in the adults, uh, in mice, and in, in, in humans. The only place where gastrin, not in the pancreas, but the only place where gastrin is present is in the stomach and it's made in the G cells of the antrum of the stomach, but not in the pancreas. Now, it gets turned back on, and so we don't know, is this a microRNA or what's controlling it to be shut on and shut off? Um, and that's some of the areas we're looking at. But it gets turned back on in, in precancerous, they're called panin lesions of the pancreas, and it gets turned back on early on when KRAS gets activated in pancreatic cancer, and that's when it drives the, the progression to pancreatic cancer. So the question was, how did the company make the vaccine against the gastrin? So we know that the cancer cells can respond to gastrin from two sources. One is a, a paracrine effect, which is the gastrin that we all make in our stomachs that helps us digest food and causes the release of gastric acid. Okay, so that's the exogenous paracrine effect. So if you, all of us have gastrin floating around in our blood, but then the second place where gastrin comes to play in cancer is the autocrine effect, where the cancer cells are producing their own gastrin to stimulate their own growth. So there's two methods, but gastrin is still the, the ligand, regardless of where it's coming from, that's stimulating the growth. So, so they developed a vaccine, and actually it's hooked up to diphtheria toxin, and uh, they inject it, and it, it causes an immune response. And part of that is because of the adjuvant that they use to stimulate the immune response. Does that answer your question? So it's a peptide, so it's not going to bind to the receptor. So it's it's not. So the question was, does it does it hurt their stomach cells at all? Right. So the only advantage that it, it may have is physiologically, when we eat, your stomach releases gastrin, which causes the release of acid in the stomach. And uh, if anything, it would decrease gastric acid. So maybe you wouldn't have as much acid reflux. 
You wouldn't have, and, and on the other side, that's a good thing, right. On the other side, you know, um, they were developing a lot of drugs to, to treat this, and uh, when proton pump inhibitors came out, so proton pump inhibitors block acid release from the stomach parietal cells. And when they do that, it blocks the feedback loop. And so your stomach thinks, okay, there's not acid there. I have to make more. And so it makes more and more gastrin. And so gastrin levels can actually go up in people who chronically take high doses of proton pump inhibitors, not to scare anyone, like omeprazole or, you know, protonics or any of those. They can raise gastrin levels. So... Uh, so yes, there have been some studies where they looked at, at people um, who have uh, achlorhydrin, high gastrin levels. So it's, it's not that the gastrin itself causes the pancreatic cancer, okay? However, if you were to have pancreatic cancer or if you were to have a precancerous lesion like a panin, which we know has CCK receptors on it, and you take a medicine that raises your gastrin levels, you may stimulate the growth of these precancerous lesions. And perhaps, and I'm just speaking speculatively here, one of the reasons why pancreatic cancer has increased in the past two decades is because we've been using proton pump inhibitors and gastrin levels are going up. I don't know. That may be one of the reasons. So, other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. There's some right there. Okay, well, the bad news is the government runs out of money on Wednesday, and if Congress doesn't pass a continuing resolution, then the government shuts down and Traco shuts down. So we hope that uh, the government keeps running and there's a continuing resolution passed so that we can continue to do Traco. Uh, a second bad news is Dr. Zia, who's supposed to lecture on breast cancer, is sick. But we can do the next best thing. We can show you the video of last year's lecture. So through the miracle of modern technology, take it away. Okay, good afternoon. And Trico, we have beautiful weather out there today, a nice fall day. So uh, our first speaker is Farah Zia. She got her medical degree at George Washington University. Subsequently, she was a uh, clinical fellow here at NCI, and she's now a medical officer in the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis. Her title, Overview of Breast Cancer, Farah. All right, Terry, thank you. Um, looks like the mic is working. You guys can hear me. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, the topic today is breast cancer. It's a, a kind of a broad topic, so I'm going to try to uh, just touch on all the different areas that you might be interested in. So I think that people often forget these strides that we are actually making in cancer research. Uh, because unfortunately there are so many cancer deaths that we still see. So I thought what I would do is start by looking at how uh, breast cancer was yesterday and then talk a little bit about what it is today. <clears throat> so in 1975, the incidence rate for female breast cancer in the United States was 105 new cases diagnosed for every 100,000 women in the population. The mortality rate was 31 deaths for every 100,000 women. From 1975 to 1977, of those diagnosed with breast cancer, about 75% survived their disease about five years. Among white females, the relative survival rate was 76%, and among African Americans, it was 62%. <clears throat> so in 
1975, mastectomy was the only accepted surgical option for the treatment of breast cancer. Only one randomized trial of mammography for breast cancer screening had been completed. Several other trials in the joint NIH-ACS breast cancer detection demonstration projects were just beginning. Clinical investigation of combination chemotherapy using multiple drugs with different mechanisms of action and of hormonal therapy as post-surgical or adjuvant treatment for breast cancer was in its earliest stages. So listening to this, you can imagine these strides that we've made. <clears throat> in the mid-1970s, clinical evaluation of the drug tamoxifen um, as a hormonal treatment of breast cancer was just beginning. In the 1970s, no gene associated with an increased risk of breast cancer had been identified as of yet. So how about breast cancer today? For the years 2007 to 2011, the incidence rate for female breast cancer was 125 new cases diagnosed for every 100,000 women. Uh, the mortality, well actually, so I just want to point out that uh, the incidence rate uh, actually has gone up. But I would say that that's due more to early detection than the use of mammography we have. The mortality rate was 22 deaths for every 100,000 um, women. And 12.3% of women will be diagnosed at some point during their life. Uh, and this is using data from 2009 to 2011. <clears throat> the breast cancer death mortality rate in the US has been declining steadily since 1989, when it peaked at a rate of uh, 33 deaths for every 100,000 women. Of those diagnosed between 2004 to 2010, 89.2% .2 were expected to survive their disease at least five years. Among white women, the five-year relative survival rate was 91%. Among African-American women, it was 78%. The increase in breast cancer survival, um, as I said just now, uh, seen since the mid-1970s, has been attributed attributed to both screening and improved treatment. So this uh, graph is showing incidence and mortality uh, by race, looking at the years 1975 to 2010. And for African-American females, uh, we can see that the incidence rose sharply from 1975 to 1990. Then it reached a plateau. And for white females, the incidence has always been higher than African-American females. It rose sharply between 1980 to 1985. Um, then more recently, the incidence has declined and reached a plateau. Mortality has been uh, slowly declining for both uh, African-American females and white females. Uh, but there definitely remains a disparity, and uh, African-American females do have a higher mortality. This graph is so showing uh, US mortality rates for cancer of the breast and the lung and the bronchus using data from 1975 to 2010. Um, from 1975 to 1990, the mortality for lung cancer steadily increased and then reached a plateau uh, for both uh, white females and African-American females. The mortality rates for breast cancer have steadily declined since 1990, though again you are seeing that a clear disparity exists between white females and African-American females. Um, for both uh, white females and African-American females, lung cancer, though, still is a higher mortality rate. So what is breast cancer? It is cancer that forms in the tissues of the breast, and usually the ducts. Um, and the ducts are the tubes that carry milk to the nipple, and, and the lobules as well. Uh, they are the glands that make the milk. It occurs in both men and women, although male breast cancer it can happen, but it is rare. So this slide is showing you uh, the structure of the breast. <clears throat> the breast is composed mainly of fatty tissue. Oops, that's not what I want to do. So fatty tissue, uh, which contains a network of lobes made up Effort of tiny tube-like structures. The quick change batteries that I mentioned earlier are contain, located underneath uh, this new flat. larger bucket seat. So these now are the lobes, the and within the lobes are the lobules. The first reason uh, is that by lifting the seat and up, the, there's tiny ducts that connect the glands, the lobules, and lobes. Second reason is that and they the carry milk from the lobes to the nipple. easy way to access the quick change batteries. <laughs> All you have to do to get to them is simply grab the back of the seat, lift it, and boom, there the batteries are. 
Blood and lymph vessels run throughout the breast. About 90% of all breast cancers start in the ducts or the lobes of the breast. new batteries and you're ready to go. New chargers and batteries are available for sale on Razor.com. All right, so what are we the areas that we want to talk about today? We want to talk about ourselves. assessing for risk factors for breast cancer. We want to talk about early detection. We want to talk about diagnosing breast cancer. Uh, then one. within the lobes or the lobules, the first uh, is that by lifting the feet and up, the uh, there's tiny ducts that connect the glands, the lobules, and lobes. The second reason is that and they the carry milk from the lobes to the nipple. An easy way to access the quick change battery. <laughs> All you have to do to get to them is simply grab the back of the feet, lift it, and boom, there the batteries are. Changing Blood the and lymph vessels run throughout the breast. The batteries, About 90% of all breast cancers start in the ducts or the lobes of the breast. Your new batteries and you're ready to go. New chargers and batteries are available for sale on Razor.com. All right, so what are we the areas that we want to talk about today? We want to talk about ourselves. assessing for risk factors for breast cancer. We want to talk about early detection. We want to talk about diagnosing breast cancer. Uh, then one... Please excuse me, I'm going to pause the transmission and check for technical difficulty.
age is a risk, risk factor. Uh, about 80% of breast cancer does uh, occur in postmenopausal women. Um, also, if you have had a prior breast cancer, that puts you at, a, at risk of having a second breast cancer. Also, if you have a high-risk pre-malignant lesion, like lobular carcinoma in site 2 or atypical ductal hyperplasia, that will put you at, at increased risk. Also, excess, excess endogenous or exogenous hormones, such as if a person has an early menarche or a late menopause, or if they take hormone replacement therapy, we know that is a risk for breast cancer as well. Uh, if you've uh, not ever had any children, you have a longer exposure to estrogen in your body that puts you at risk. Or if you've had your first child at the age of greater than 35, you, you are, um, again, uh, exposing your body to more estrogen and this is thought of as a risk. Women who have a history of breast biopsies, for example, it could be for fibrocystic disease or, or something like that, um, that, but that we know puts them at a higher risk of having breast cancer. Uh, patients who have radiation exposure before the age of 40, for example, there are patients who've had, we know cases who've had uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphoma, and they've been treated with uh, radiation to the mediastinum, and uh, some cases have developed breast, breast cancer after that treatment. Uh, we think that mammogramic, mammographic density, uh, dense breasts on mammograms, is a risk factor. Uh, also, lifestyle factors, alcohol, lack of exercise, obesity, and of course, you know, obesity, you produce more estrogen in the body. <clears throat> Family history is an important risk factor. If your mother, sister, or daughter has developed breast cancer before menopause, you are three times more likely to develop the disease. If two or more close relatives, for example, your cousins, your aunt, your grandmother have developed breast cancer, you are also at increased risk. We know that genetics uh, definitely plays a big role. Uh, breast cancers have been linked to mutations in specific genes that we know. Uh, BRCA1 is, uh, is related to familial, familial breast and ovarian cancer. BRCA2 is uh, linked to familial breast cancer. P53 and retinoblastoma 1, these are tumor suppressor genes, also linked to breast cancer. HER2 new, CRP2, CMIC, these are oncogenes, also linked to breast cancer. Um, women, women with mutations in P53 and BRCA1, they have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of 85%. I'm going to talk about early detection, and I do want to point out that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So you might want to share some of this information with a family member, your mother, your sister, an aunt. So the American Cancer Society guidelines for the early detection of breast cancer. So annual mammograms, uh, they recommend starting at age 40 and continuing as long as the woman is in good health. Uh, they recommend clinical breast exams every three years for women in their 20s and 30s and annually after the age of 40. Breast self-exam is an option for women starting in their 20s, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the breast self-exam, that's an opportunity for a woman to become familiar with her own body. So if there is a change, it can be detected quickly. Um, if one does it, it should begin at the age of 20, and it should continue monthly thereafter. So these are just some quick pictures to show you how a breast self-exam is done. You start by standing and looking uh, in the mirror with your shoulders straight, with your arms on the hips. You look uh, for any changes in size, shape, color. Uh, you look for things that are not good, like dimpling, puckering, inverted nipple, or any nipple discharge. And you do that also in the position with your arms raised above your head so you can take a good look under the armpits where there's also breast tissue. The next step is to uh, lie flat um, and fill your breast while lying down. You want to use a firm, smooth touch. You want to keep your fingers flat and together. Uh, you, there are different ways to do it, but one way is to use a circular motion. And, but the most important thing is you want to follow a pattern and you want to cover the whole breast. So you do this both lying down 
and standing up or sitting. So I said that the self-breast exam is an option, so I'll explain it here. In 2002, the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force recommended against teaching self-breast exams based on evidence indicating that uh, the self-breast exam did not reduce breast cancer mortality. The decision was largely based on one randomized clinical trial indicating no difference in breast cancer mortality after 10 years um, in Shanghai factory workers who were randomly assigned to receive self-breast exam instruction versus the control group. Um, and the same study showed that self-breast exams uh, resulted in more breast biopsies and diagnosis of benign lesions. Um, but I just have to say that most clinicians actually do still recommend the self-breast exam. I think it's a good way to, to pick up things in between your physician visits, which for most people are just annually or every three years if you're younger. But that is the data from a study. <clears throat> okay, as far as clinical exam, um, it should be performed by a doctor or trained nurse practitioner. The clinical breast exams have been uh, shown to decrease mortality based on evidence from the Canadian National Breast Screening Study. So, um, oops. so the clinical exam is recommended every two to three years between the age of 20 to 40 um, and annually for women over 40. So abnormal signs um, and symptoms. Um, so what are you looking for when you're doing uh, your own exams uh, or just you know, paying attention to yourself uh, during the year? You want to make sure that there's no change in breast size, there's no pain or tenderness, although I do have to point out that more, most breast cancers, there's no pain, there's no tenderness. Um, it's often a painless lump <clears throat> that may be able to be felt, it may not. It may be picked up on mammography. Uh, also redness, change in nipple position, scaling around the nipples, sore, um, sore breasts uh, that don't heal, puckering, dimpling, retraction, nipple discharge, thickening of skin, or lump or a knot, or a retracted nipple. So mammograms. Uh, mammograms can be used as a screening tool to detect early breast cancer in women experiencing no symptoms. Mammograms can also be used to detect and diagnose breast uh, disease in women experiencing symptoms such as a lump, pain, or nipple discharge. So we know that breast cancer screening mammography reduces mortality by 26% in women aged 50 to 74 uh, and 17% in, in women 40 to 49. Uh, there's probably a higher incidence rate of breast cancers in the 50 to 74 age group. Um, other modalities of screening in high-risk women, um, digital mammography, but in, a, in fact, I think most uh, institutions now do use digital mammography. Um, the, the advantage is that an electronic image is stored as a computer file, and the image can be enhanced, magnified, manipulated, so you can really get a good look of what's in there as compared to the, the old films that people did. Um, we also use MRI, uh, especially in women who have... Uh, a greater breast density, which makes mammography difficult. Um, but uh, so the MRI, it has sensitivity, um, is, it's higher than mammogram. Um, so it's more often positive in disease, but uh, the specificity for MRI is lower than mammo. So you also end up with more false positives and more biopsies, and that's the downside. So diagnosis, how do we diagnose breast cancer? So biopsy obviously is necessary to ascertain whether a lesion is benign or cancerous and involves removing a sample of breast tissue. So there are several methods of breast biopsy these days. The most appropriate method depends on certain characteristics of a lesion, its size, its location, its appearance, um, and how it's accessible. So, uh, one of the most common ways is a fine needle aspiration. It's most often done on a palpable lesion when you can feel it where, uh, where the needle is going to go into. Um, it's a percutaneous biopsy using a fine gauge needle, and you it can withdraw fluid from a cyst or it could take some cells from a, a solid mass. Uh, another technique is the core needle biopsy. Um, 
It is done uh, using mammography and ultrasound guidance. Uh, therefore, it can be used on non-palpable lesions. Um, a hollow spring-loaded device is fired into the breast and uh, you get one sample per firing. So the poor patient is subjected to at least 10 to 20, they'll need at least 10 to 20 samples from the different areas within um, the lesion. So it's 10 to 20 times they'll have to fire this thing to get the samples. Um, then there is something called vacuum biopsy. It's a mammotome biopsy is using a vacuum assisted system. It's also guided by ultrasound guidance or stereotactic guidance. And stereotactic guidance is a two angle x-ray so you can see the lesion and where you're going. Uh, it's very quick, there's no pain. It's actually more commonly done these days than some of the other procedures. Um, it's three times more accurate uh, than core biopsy for early breast cancer. Um, it the reason for that is because uh, it takes a, a wide area of tissue and uh, it allows for sampling of microcalcifications. And microcalcifications are very often seen in early breast cancer. Uh, then there is the ABBI method, which is called, which is automated stereotactical uh, surgical biopsy. And uh, this um, cannula, it's a large cylinder, and uh, the good thing about it, again, is it takes a su sufficient amount of tissue in one pass through the lesion. Uh, and uh, it, it's able to take, uh, the, the cylinder is large enough that you're able to take a sampling surrounding the uninvolved area, which is, which is good. And then open surgical biopsy is done by a general surgeon in the operating room, which is also, I guess, a good technique uh, uh, in that you're able to get the whole lesion and you're able to get normal tissue surrounding. This is just uh, a picture of a um, device for the vacuum-assisted or mammotome biopsy. <clears throat> uh, this is just a picture showing you, um, you know, like I said earlier, that sometimes uh, lesions are not palpable, but they're picked up on mammogram. And therefore, uh, the interventional radiologist who's going to do the biopsy will need ultrasound gu guidance in order to locate the lesion. And here you just see what the breast mass will look like on ultrasound, and you'll see the, ne the needle approaching it for the biopsy. Sometimes uh, something is seen on mammogram, and it turns out to be a cyst. And uh, so oftentimes mammograms are followed up by ultrasounds to see whether the, the lesion is a sol solid lesion or a cystic lesion. Um, and here uh, you see an ultrasound how a cyst will look on ultrasound. Uh, it's biopsied, and if the fluid that's withdrawn from the cyst is clear, it's most often benign, and cysts are most often benign. But if it's bloody, then you'll have to be concerned for a malignancy. But that's not often the case in breast cancer. So what are the types of breast cancer? Um, so as you know, a pathologist will review the biopsy to give a final pathological diagnosis. So uh, ductal, car <coughs> ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, these are types of non-invasive breast cancer, DCIS and LCIS. So DCIS is the most common type of non-invasive breast cancer. The cancer is only in the ducts, and it has not spread through the wall of the ducts into the tissue of the breast. And nearly all women with cancer at this stage can be cured. Um, it's the best, the best form of early detection for this lesion is with a mammogram, because DCIS is non-palpable, and it's asymptomatic, and like I said, it's routinely picked up. You know, if a woman comes and has a routine mammogram, um, and often these are the lesions that are the reason for the, we are seeing increased incidence of breast cancer, but you know, we are picking them up early and they're treatable and curable. Globular carcinoma in situ, uh, this condition begins in the milk glands, uh, but does not go through the wall of the lobules into the breast tissue. And although it's not a true cancer, it does increase your risk of developing a cancer later in life. So it's important that women who do have uh, lobular carcinoma in situ follow up with regular mammograms. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so as far as invasive breast cancer, again, you've got uh, invasive ductal carcinoma, IDC, and invasive lobular carcinoma, ILC. So IDC, this is the second most common type of breast cancer, um, accounting for 
eight out of 10 invasive breast cancers. Um, it starts in the duct, it breaks through the duct wall and it invades into the tissue, that's why it's invasive. From there, it may enter into the lymphatics and spread to other parts of the body. Uh, from the lobules, it can go through the wall again and into the breast tissue and then it can enter the lymphatics. But LC, um, ILC accounts for only one-tenth of the invasive cancers. We do really see a lot of uh, IDC in the community. Uh, inflammatory breast cancer, so what is that? Well, it's rare. It only accounts for 1% to 5% of all breast cancer cases in the United States. It's the most aggressive form of breast cancer. And the symptoms uh, include a, a diffuse erythema involving the majority of the breast, uh, peau de range, which is uh, the breast looking like uh, the skin of an orange. It'll have an erysipeloid edge, which is redness at the edge. Oftentimes, there is no palpable mass. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this type of breast cancer has a significantly lower overall survival uh, rate. <laughs> Compared with other types of breast cancer, inflammatory breast cancer tends to be diagnosed at younger ages. Uh, we know that the median age is 57 years compared with a median age of 62 for other types of breast cancer. Um, it is more common um, and diagnosed at younger ages in African-American women. Um, the median age at diagnosis in the African-American population is 54, and that's compared with a median age of 58 in uh, white females. Inflammatory breast tumors are frequently hormone receptor negative, uh, which means that hormone therapies uh, are not uh, uh, effective in these, in these cancers. Uh, and inflammatory breast cancer is more common in obese women than in women of normal weight. So what is the, what causes the inflammatory breast cancer? Well, we don't know what causes this, but the appearance. Uh, the appearance is caused by the rapidly accumulating malignant cells that infiltrate and clog the lymphatic vessels in the skin of the breast, uh, which are the dermal lymphatics. And the blockage in the lymphatic vessels causes, uh, that's what causes the appearance of the swollen and the dimpled uh, skin and the classic signs that we're seeing in inflammatory breast cancer. So what are the guidelines developed by an international panel of experts? Um, so the minimum criteria for diagnosis uh, is the following. So patients often see, uh, when, you, when you're talking to a patient, uh, this is the history that you often get from, from them, a rapid onset of erythema, uh, and swelling and a peau de range appearance and or abnormal breast warmth. Uh, sometimes they can feel a lump, but most often not. And usually the symptoms last less than six months or they have seen it for less than six months. Uh, oftentimes the erythema can cover uh, at least a third or more of the breast. <clears throat> and the initial biopsy samples will often show invasive carcinoma. This is a picture of uh, somebody with inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, this is an African-American female. You probably cannot appreciate the erythema, but you can see the peau de range look, the, the skin that's dimpled and looks like an orange peel. Very classic. Uh, these are also uh, varied presentations of inflammatory breast cancer. Um, I have to say that oftentimes it goes misdiagnosed because Physicians, especially primary care physicians, seem to think it's a mastitis. I have seen too many unfortunate cases where patients will come in maybe six months after having these symptoms, after being treated by antibiotic after antibiotic for a mastitis. Um, especially, unfortunately, in women um, uh, who've had a recent pregnancy and are, you know, uh, nursing. Uh, Babies, I, I think that a lot of physicians will think, well, it's a mastitis. But sometimes uh, breast cancers do show up post-pregnancy. So very unfortunate, but you have to be on thinking all the time. This is something not good. So what is the prognosis for inflammatory breast cancer? Because inflammatory breast cancer usually develops quickly and spreads aggressively to other parts of the body, Women diagnosed with this disease in general do not survive, unfortunately, as long as, as those diagnosed with other types of breast cancer. Um, the five-year relative survival for women uh, with this, um, the 
Statistics have shown from 1988 through 2001, it was 34 percent. And that's compared with a five-year uh, relative survival of 87 percent with women who have been diagnosed with other types of invasive breast cancer, uh, most commonly the IDC. All right, so staging. Um, once the cancer is diagnosed, it has to be staged. Um, so staging is a way of describing a cancer such as the size of a tumor and if or where it has spread. Staging is the most important tool doctors have to determine a patient's prognosis. And also the stage of the cancer dictates what kind of treatment options a patient has. Um, just briefly, I'll go through the staging. Um, so stage zero, it's known as uh, the carcinoma in situ. Um, the cancer has not spread past the ducts or the lobules and it's a non-invasive cancer. Stage one, the tumor uh, is less than or equal to two centimeters and it, there's no lymph node involvement. Stage two A, less than or equal to two centimeters, uh, but it can involve up to one to three lymph nodes, or it could be uh, between two and five centimeters, but it still has not uh, spread to the lymph nodes. Um, or you can see no lesion in the breast, but you still could have one to three nodes, and that's still a stage two A. Stage 2B, uh, it's going to be, it could be between 2 and 5 centimeters, but it has also spread to between 1 and 3 lymph nodes, or greater than 5 centimeters and no lymph node involvement. 3A, uh, you can see uh, nothing in the breast, uh, or you can see any size tumor and up to 4 to 9 lymph nodes, uh, or you can see a tumor that's greater than 5 centimeters, and you can see small clusters of cancer cells in the lymph nodes. Um, or greater than five centimeters and one to three lymph nodes. Staging is always changing. It has changed so many times. They're continually refining the stages. And stage 3B, uh, the tumor may be any size, but has spread to the chest wall and or skin of the breast, causing swelling or ulceration. Uh, it also may involve up to nine lymph nodes. Uh, so inflammatory breast cancer is at least a stage 3B at diagnosis. Uh, stage 3C, you can see no evidence of any disease in the breast, or, or the tumor may be of any size, and the cancer may have spread to the skin or chest wall, causing ulceration. And you can also see 10 or more axillary, axillary lymph nodes, or uh, you can also see lymph nodes above or below the collarbone, which is also known as the uh, supercop. Stage four breast cancer, um, stage four, it's, um, so breast cancer can be any size, but it has spread to distant uh, parts of the body, and uh, the more common places for breast cancer to go um, are bones, lungs, liver, chest wall, or brain. So what is the lymphatic system? Uh, <coughs> the lymphatic system is part of the circulatory system. And it comprises a network of lymphatic vessels that carry a clear fluid called lymph toward the heart. And the lymph nodes, they're part of the lymphatic system. They're small round clumps of immune cells that are part of the, uh, the whole system. They act as filters and they remove foreign materials such as bacteria and cancer cells. So here uh, you can see uh, cancer cells that are escaping into the lymphatics. Uh, from the lymphatics, you know they can travel through the body. Uh, at the top, you see a normal duct, then you see a, a non-invasive cancer, and at the bottom, you see an invasive cancer that has broken through the duct wall and is now getting into the lymphatic channels and into the lymph node. <clears throat> so what are the uh, lymph nodes that are commonly involved in breast cancer? Uh, they are the supraclavicular chain, the axillary chain, and the internal mammary chain. So let's talk about axillary lymph node dissection. So this is a traditional procedure for staging breast cancer. And it involves removing 10 to 30 lymph nodes in the armpit closest to the tumor. Uh, the benefits of doing a full axillary dissection are that all of the lymph nodes can be examined for cancer. Um, it's a reliable determination whether cancer is spreading. Uh, but the drawbacks here, uh, there's always drawbacks to everything. Um, is that it could cause post-surgical complications such as lymphedema, infection, nerve damage, nerve damage from the surgery, um, 
well, when there's lymphedema, that could result in infection, and, and it could really be cumbersome. So let's talk about sentinel nodes. Uh, the term sentinel is derived from the French word sentinel, which means to guard over or vigilance. Um, the sentinel, sentinel lymph node is the first node that lymphatic fluid passes through in a group of lymph nodes. It is the protective node that acts as the first filter for harmful material. A sentinel lymph node biopsy, uh, it's a less invasive method to determine if axillary nodes contain cancer with fe uh, fewer complications uh, than a full axillary dissection. During surgery, isosulfan blue and or technetium 99 is injected near the tumor or under the nipple. The tracer and dye mix with fluids uh, that travel to the lymph node and the sentinel Sentinel node is the first node that receives the drainage. Uh, so that one is removed and is sent for pathological review. And if cancer is present, then the surgeon will take out more lymph nodes. If there's no cancer, then no more lymph nodes are taken and the patient is spared all the uh, problems with a full dissection. Uh, so we know that sentinel lymph node dissection accurately identifies nodal metastasis of early breast cancer, but it's not clear whether uh, if you go ahead and do further nodal dissection, does, is it, does it affect survival? Is it better in the long run? So there was a phase three randomized clinical trial that was done. Um, it was conducted to determine the effects of complete <laughs> nodal dissection on survival of patients with uh, sentinel lymph node mets. So it was, this uh, study was open at 115 sites and it, it enrolled uh, back, back from May 1999 to December 2004. Uh, patients with invasive breast cancer uh, but no palpable adenopathy uh, and one to two sentinel lymph nodes containing mats were, that were identified by frozen section, uh, touch prep or h &E, stain on permanent sections. Uh, uh, they were the patients on the study. Um, so those who uh, had sentinel lymph node mats, they were uh, randomized to either getting a full axillary dissection of 10 or more nodes or to no, no further treatment all, at all. And the primary uh, endpoint of this uh, trial was overall survival. The secondary endpoint was disease-free survival. Results showed that at a median follow-up of 6.3 years, a five years overall survival was 91.8% with a full axillary dissection and 92.5% with just the central node. The five-year disease-free survival was 82.2% with axillary and 83.9% with the central node. And these results were statistically significant. Um, so the conclusion was that among patients with limited uh, sentinel mets, um, breast cancer treated with breast conservation and systemic therapy, the use of only taking the sentinel node alone compared with axillary dissection did not result in inferior survival. So it's okay just to spare the patient and just do the central node. So prognosis. Um, prognosis uh, is the likely outcome for a patient diagnosed with cancer, and it is often viewed as the chance that the cancer will be treated successfully and that the patient will recover completely. Many factors can influ influence a cancer patient's prognosis, including the type and location of the cancer, the stage of the disease, the patient's age, and overall general health and the extent to which the patient's disease re responds to treatment. So treating the cancer, these are the different um, things that we have to work with. <clears throat> so what are the basic factors that doctors will consider in planning breast cancer treatment? Again, they'll look at the stage of the disease, the pathological grade of a tumor, uh, which can range from one to three, uh, three being more aggressive, um, hormone receptor status, they, they look at HER2 status, the patient's age and general health, the patient's menopausal status, and the presence of known mutations. Uh, so as far as treating early stage disease uh, for both DCIS and early stage invasive breast cancer, doctors generally recommend surgery to remove the tumor. To ensure that the entire tumor is removed, the surgeon will also remove a small area of tissue around the tumor. Although surgery aims to remove all of the cancer, it is known that many times microscopic cells can be left behind either in the breast or elsewhere. So what is the next step in treatment after surgery? The next step in the management is to lower the risk of recurrence um, and to get rid of any hidden cancer cells that remain, and this is called adjuvant therapy. 
Adjuvant therapies include radiation therapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and targeted therapy. Um, the need for adjuvant therapy is determined based on an estimate of the chance of the residual cancer in the breast or the body, uh, uh, the chance of recurrence. Although adjuvant therapy lowers the risk of recurrence, it definitely does not necessarily eliminate them. As far as uh, inflammatory breast cancer, uh, the, the treatment steps, um, I just want to make mention that it's a multimodal approach. Inflammatory breast cancer is treated first with systemic chemotherapy to help shrink the tumor, as opposed to the normal routine um, of surgery followed by adjuvant therapy. So in this case, we, we do systemic chemotherapy, then uh, that's followed with surgery to remove the tumor, and then followed by radiation therapy. Uh, and then we, the clinical trials have shown that there is better responses to therapy and longer survival with this approach. Um, so metastatic uh, breast cancer, uh, what are the goals of treatment here? So as you know, it is a stage four cancer. It's non-curable at this point. So pro prolongation of survival is uh, the goal. Uh, we want to improve the quality of life for the patients, and uh, we want to improve their symptoms. But part of improving the quality of life is that you don't want to give medications that are so toxic that are that are more debilitating, debilitating to the patient than the disease itself. So in, breast, in the case of breast cancer, we do have the option of hormonal therapy. And if that is uh, the case for patients, that is what we prefer to do first. Um, if chemotherapy is what we need to do, we prefer to use single agent therapy in metastatic disease as opposed to combination chemotherapy. Let's talk about hormone therapy. So targeting the estrogen pathway, well, estrogen is a well-recognized growth factor for the majority of breast cancers. Uh, that makes it a, <clears throat> a very lucrative um, preventive, preventive target and for treatment as well. Um, so estrogen pathway can be targeted in two ways. Uh, you can use drugs that work um, at the receptor, uh, the selective estrogen receptor modulators, which include tamoxifen and raloxifene. Uh, and uh, you can also use agents that interfere with estrogen synthesis. And, uh, the, for example, the aromatase inhibitors, uh, the, the GnRH analogs, and you can do oophorectomy. Um, the aromatase inhibitors, they inhibit aromatase, which is an enzyme found in peripheral tissues, uh, such as uh, the fat, the liver, the muscle, the brain. Uh, Aromatase will convert uh, androstenedione and testosterone to uh, eventually to estradiol, which could uh, which would go and interact with the estrogen receptor. So aromatase inhibitors block the enzyme and block the production of estradiol. Uh, tamoxifen will act at the receptor. Um, tamoxifen is uh, a agonist on the bone and the uterus, um, and it's an antagonist at the breast. So uh, with the uterus, you have to worry about, uh, since it's an agonist over there, you do have to worry about uterine cancers, and that is the downside to treating with tamoxifen. Uh, raloxifene is often actually uh, used uh, it, both in treatment and in prevention. It's an agonist on the bone. It acts like a estrogen on the bone, which is good because it can be used for osteoporosis. Uh, but it's an antagonist uh, on the breast and the uterus. Uh, which, again, is good. for the uterus, it's good because you don't have to worry about um, developing uterine cancer with raloxifene. So it is, it's a good agent for prevention um, and for patients who uh, want to prevent osteoporosis but also have a high-risk family history of uh, breast cancer. <clears throat> All right, so I just want to make mention that uh, they, at, NC, at NCI, we have developed a tool that weighs the benefits and risks of raloxifene or tamoxifen to prevent breast, breast cancer. Um, and um, so all those studies have shown that tamoxifen and raloxifene can both be used to reduce the risk of developing invasive breast cancer in high-risk women. The drugs can also cause adverse side effects. Um, I didn't mention uh, tamoxifen. The other side effects you have to worry about are blood clots, uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. 
So these are not minor side effects. You, you do only want to give it to patients if you have to, if that's your choice. So women and their physicians must decide whether the potential benefits of one or the other drug outweigh the risks in each patient's particular situation. So researchers from the NCI um, in the DCP and DCCPS, they led a study from which they have developed a benefit risk index to help guide decisions on whether postmenopausal women at increased risk should take either drugs. So the researchers um, who led the study, they used data from previous prevention studies, and uh, they considered uh, possible adverse effects, like I just mentioned, uh, bone fractures, blood clots, stroke, endometrial cancer, rates of which were um, potentially increased or decreased by tamoxifen or raloxifene. They then assigned a weight to each possible adverse outcome and to uh, invasive and in situ breast cancer. And then they calculated the probability that a woman with a particular risk factors would have each outcome in five years with or without taking these medications. So they used these calculations to create a color-coded uh, color-coded tables for each drug that show that for each age group um, and five-year projected risk of invasive cancer, whether there is strong or moderate evidence that the benefits outweigh the risks or that the risks outweigh the benefits for that particular patient. So this is being used clinically. Um, this is just some data showing you that uh, tamoxifen uh, definitely uh, is beneficial. It does reduce uh, the risk of reoccurrence. So let's uh, talk about tamoxifen pharmacogenetics. Um, it's been a few years now that this has been out, but uh, we now know that the growth inhibitory effects of tamoxifen is mediated by its metabolites, uh, for hydroxy tamoxifen and endoxifen. Um, the formation of these active metabolites is catalyzed by the uh, P450 uh, enzyme, P450 2D6, CYP 2D6 enzyme. So approximately 100 CYP CYP 2D6 genetic variants have been identified. Uh, these manifest in the population as four distinct phenotypes. Um, so people can be either have normal activity of uh, of this or reduced activity or no activity or high activity. So it can be speculated that genotype related differences in the form, uh, formation of active metabolites influence, influence therapeutic response to tamoxifen. So everybody's different in how they metabolize uh, tamoxifen and how they uh, will respond to it. As far as aromatase inhibitors, uh, there are three that are approved by the FDA, anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestane. Um, exemestane uh, is an aromatase inhibitor which had been used to treat early and advanced stage breast cancer. And um, they discovered that it substantially reduced the risk of invasive breast cancer in postmenopausal women at high risk of developing the disease. Uh, the MAP3 trial. They looked at 4,560 high-risk postmenopausal post women, and they randomly assigned them to receiving either exemestane daily for five years or getting a placebo. And those who received exemestane, they see that 11 women developed invasive breast cancer, and of those who received placebo uh, in five years, uh, 32 women developed invasive breast cancer. So the key points from the, from the MAP3 trial were that women who took exemestane were 65% less likely than women who took a placebo to develop breast cancer. This is the largest reduction in risk seen in any of the prevention trials uh, that have been done to date. Um, in previous trials, daily use of tamoxifen or raloxifene reduced breast cancer by 50% and 38% in five-year follow-up. So data from this trial indicates that exemestane may provide another option for breast cancer risk reduction. The trial did not reveal any serious side effects, such as those for tamoxifen. And the follow-up for this trial is ongoing. They need a longer follow-up. It is still not uh, actually approved, FDA approved, as a preventative agent. <clears throat> so systemic adjuvant chemo. Um, so here in the graphs, um, so they're showing uh, re reduction in uh, recurrence and mortality in the two age groups, age less than 15, age 50 to 69. And so the, 
both age groups do benefit from the polychemotherapy, but the greatest reduction in recurrence and mortality is seen in those that are less than 50 years old. So polychemotherapy is usually what we do uh, as adjuvant chemotherapy when we're trying to um, trying for, to go for a cure. And it definitely has benefit over single agent therapy. So this is just uh, looking at systemic chemotherapy and showing uh, that different types of breast cancer have different sensitivities to chemotherapy. Uh, we can see that those um, breast cancers that are endocrine dependent or hormone dependent, they are more chemotherapy resistant. And those that are endocrine independent or hormone independent, they are more chemotherapy sensitive. So all of these things are taken into account when, when physicians uh, make a decision of treatment. Here I just listed some chemotherapies. You can take a look at them. Uh, so HER2, uh, so it's a member of the membrane-spanning type 1 receptor uh, tyrosine kinase family, uh, comprising four closely related family members. They dimerize upon ligand stimulation and transduce their signals by subsequent autophosphorylation. They're catalyzed by the receptor tyrosine kinase activity. Uh, this results in recruitment of downstream signaling, and the incidence of RB2 amplification is about 30% in breast cancer. Therefore, it is a, a definite th therapeutic target. Um, HER2 uh, or trastuzumab, <clears throat> uh, it targets, uh, trastuzumab uh, targets the HER2 protein. It has a high affinity and specificity. Uh, it is 95% human, 5% murine. Um, this decreases the potential for immunogenicity. It increases potential for recruiting immune effector mechanisms. Uh, it was approved for early stage breast cancer in 2005. It, when you add it to chemotherapy, it increases overall survival and increases disease-free survival. And this is just a, a graph that again shows you that when you add Herceptin to chemotherapy, uh, you improve disease-free sur survival significantly in patients uh, that are HER2 new positive. Triple negative breast cancer. Um, it refers to specific subtype of breast cancer that does not express the genes for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2. It is diagnosed more frequently in younger women, African Americans, Hispanics, women with BRCA1 mutations. It's clinically characterized as more aggressive. It's less responsive to standard chemotherapy. Uh, it's associated with a poor overall uh, prognosis. Um, you can see from this uh, graph that uh, survival as compared to luminal A, which is a typical invasive ductal carcinoma, survival for triple negative drops uh, steeply uh, after about uh, 60 months. So here we're looking at <clears throat> I'm just going to skip. platinum agents. Uh, so these are just agents. Uh, we know that platinum agents are more effective in triple negative breast cancer. Bepilone is also has been shown to be a good agent in triple negative breast cancer. There's so many, there's so few treatment options um, with these patients, unfortunately. So how can we do better? Um, so we definitely need better selection of chemotherapy regimens and gene expression profiling to predict response to particular agents. We need a better selection of patients for treatment with chemotherapy. We need to treat only those patients who are most likely to recur and who will therefore benefit from the addition of chemotherapy. Um, so that brings us to the Taylor X trial. I guess I'll talk about that in a second. Um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a pre-surgical chemotherapy that allows for uh, assessment of tumor response because you're giving it before the lesion has actually been surgically removed. So you're actually seeing if the chemotherapy is effective or not at reducing the size of the lesion. We often use this both in clinical and research settings. Uh, recently, uh, last year, ODAC um, uh, approved, uh, voted to approve Genentech's uh, pertuzumab for neoadjuvant treatment in, in patients with high risk for two positive early stage breast cancer. Um, and this uh, recommendation was based on two phase two studies. Um, and uh, 
So uh, actually, pertuzumab is on its way to becoming the first neoadjuvant breast cancer treatment approved in the U.S. and the first treatment approved based on pathological complete response. Uh, I think it was like 33% of the patients from the trial showed a pathological complete response uh, with this agent. So full approval is still pending and data are expected in 2016 from a study that's ongoing. So an important question in breast cancer treatment, what is the likelihood of distant recurrence in patients with breast cancer who have no involved lymph nodes and estrogen receptor positive tumors? These patients' prognosis is poorly defined uh, by histopathological and clinical measures. So what do we do with these patients? So Oncotype DX, this is uh, a multi-step approach uh, that was used. It's, we, to develop an assay for the expression of tumor-related genes for use with paraffin-embedded tumor tissue. Um, so an RT-PCR method was developed to quantify gene expression with paraffin-embedded tumor tissue. 250 candidate genes were selected from published literature, genomic databases, and experiments based on DNA arrays done on, uh, on frozen tissue. Data was analyzed um, on 447 patients. Um, to test the relationship between gene, uh, gene expression, occurrence of breast cancer. Then they used the results of the three studies to select a panel of 16 cancer-related genes and five reference genes. Um, these were the ones with the best RT-PCR performance and the most robust prediction. They designed an algorithm based on the levels of expression of these genes to compute a recurrence score for each tumor sample being tested. Um, then they had to validate the test, uh, and then they used paraffin-embedded tissue samples from patients who were previously enrolled in the B14 trial, um, and they used that to validate the ability of the uh, 21 gene RT-PCR assay and the recurrence score algorithm to quantify the likelihood that these patients would recur uh, distantly. So the patients from the NSABB, NSABP B14 trial, they were node negative, they were ER positive, they were early stage breast cancer patients who had been previously treated with tamoxifen. So these are the patients we don't know. They have a good prognosis, but do, they, do we need to give them chemotherapy? That's the question. Or can we just give them hormonal therapy? So here we see that the, uh, the risk score that was provided by the Oncotype DX assay appears to actually provide an accurate estimate of the chance of recurrence by risk category. When they looked at the patients from the B14 trial, they saw that those who were placed into a low risk category, and they followed these patients for 10 years, those patients had a low rate of distant recurrence. And those who were placed in a high-risk category per the Oncotype DX assay, they actually did have a high rate of distant reoccurrence at 10-year follow-up. So based on this study, the recurrence score has been validated um, as uh, quantifying the likelihood of distant recurrence in the tamoxifen-treated patients with node-negative ER-positive breast cancer. So patients with tumors that have a high recurrence score have a large absolute benefit of chemotherapy. So the more likely you are to recur, uh, you, you will have a, uh, a higher benefit from chemotherapy. That's clear. And patients with tumors that have low recurrence scores, uh, they have minimal benefit, if any, from chemotherapy. And that's clear. <clears throat> Okay, so there's ongoing research using results from the Oncotype DX assay. The Taylor X assay, as I mentioned before, um, it's a trial assigning individualized options for treatment. And then there's another ongoing trial that's using data from the Oncotype DX assay. That's the uh, SWOG RX Ponder trial. So running out of time, but uh, Taylor X is a landmark trial. It represents the culmination of a major initiative to integrate molecular diagnostic testing into clinical decision making. Uh, the primary objective is to determine whether adjuvant hormonal therapy is not inferior to chemo hormonal therapy in women with a mid-range oncotype DX score. So these are the patients we don't know what to do with. Like I said, the ones who have 
a, a low score, we know they're not going to benefit from chemotherapy. The ones that have a high score, we know they will benefit from chemotherapy. What do you do with the patients who have an intermediate range score? Do you give them chemo? Do you not give them chemo? Um, that's the, the Taylor X is going to answer some of these questions. Um, so they're also going to create a tissue and specimen bank for patients enrolled in this trial uh, to include tumor specimens, tumor uh, tissue microarrays, plasma, and DNA from peripheral blood. So NCI is using Oncotype DX to identify and assign treatment to more than uh, 10,000 breast cancer patients from 1,500 sites in the U.S., Canada, and Peru. And uh, accrual was completed in 2010, but the research is ongoing, and results should be around the corner in 2015. Um, so that this is the schema for the Taylor RX, uh, so I'm not going to go into that. But the key points, uh, it's going to examine whether genes that are frequently associated with recurrence for women with early stage breast cancer can be used to assign patients to the most appropriate and effective treatment. So can genes predict treatment? The results of this trial could eventually spare many women the unnecessary toxicity of chemotherapy. Uh, at, at this point, we really don't know what to do with a group a certain group of patients uh, who are in the mid-range. Um, most of them do end up getting chemotherapy. Uh, and so it is one of the first trials to examine a methodology to personalize cancer treatment. And this is the other trial that's ongoing right now. It's a key trial. Uh, it's evaluating the use of adjuvant endocrine therapy with or without chemo in patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. So. Uh, Specifically, this trial is going to look at women with recurrent scores from the Oncotype DX assay, less than or equal to 25, and one to three positive nodes. Again, mid-range scores, and the question is, these are hormone receptor positive patients. Do they need chemotherapy? Approximately 9,400 uh, patients will be screened in order to randomize 4,000, and again, it's currently ongoing. We are still waiting for answers. Uh, the MPAC trial, I just want to let you know what we, are doing in, um, what we are doing in the DCTD clinic right now. So our clinic uh, launched a trial in January 2014. The purpose is to assess whether assigning treatment based on specific gene mutations can provide benefit to patients with metastatic solid tumors. Uh, during the screening process, um, uh, samples of tumors from patients with various cancers will be genetically sequenced to look for a total of 391 different mutations in 20 genes. Uh, if mutations of interest are detected, those patients will be enrolled in the trial and randomly assigned to one of two treatment arms. Uh, one arm is going to get a targeted treatment particular to their gene mutation, and the other treatment arm is going to get another non-targeted therapy, which is uh, a good choice therapy, but not targeted to the mutation. Uh, patients who progress on arm B are uh, allowed to cross over to A. So what we don't know is whether using this approach is really effective at providing clinical benefit. Uh, most tumors, that you, you know, as you know, have multiple mutations, and it is often not clear which one is, you know, you need to target in order to achieve the maximal benefit. Um, once a gene is mutated, it can lead to the activation of multiple pathways. Uh, so at the trial that we're doing in our clinic, the, uh, the MPAC trial, is designed to de determine whether people with specific mutations will benefit from specifically chosen targeted interventions, and if these interventions lead to better outcomes. Um, do I have time to just finish the last four slides, or? So tomorrow, okay, ending with just a few slides. Um, so what are the goals in breast cancer research? I just want to finish with that. So we will use our rapidly increasing knowledge in the fields of cancer genomics and cell biology to develop more effective and less toxic treatments for breast cancer and improve our ability to identify cancers that are more likely to reoccur. Um, this is exemplified by the Oncotype DX assay. So we will use this knowledge to tailor breast cancer therapy to the individual patient. That is the key. That's what we're interested in right now. This is what the early drug development clinic is focused on, is targeted therapy. Um, for example, uh, gene expression analysis has led to the identification of five subtypes of breast cancer that have distinct biological features, clinical outcomes, and response to chemo. This knowledge can be exploited in the development of treatment strategies based on the specific characteristic of a particular woman's tumor. Not tumors in general, but a specific woman's tumor. And then this is exemplified by the Taylor X uh, trial that I talked about a minute ago. Um, 
So furthermore, a patient's response to chemo is influenced not only by the genetic characteristics of their tumor, but also by inherited variations in genes that affect the body's ability <laughs> to absorb, metabolize, and eliminate drugs. Our knowledge will enable us to predict tumor responses to individual chemotherapy drugs or classes of drugs, as well as the likelihood of severe adverse events from them. So this is specifically to each patient. So different patients metabolize drugs in different ways, and when we know uh, the variations, we will know which patients are better responders than others. And this is exemplified by the studies on endoxin. Uh, we will use our increasing knowledge of the immune system to enhance the body's ability to recognize and destroy cancer cells. Our current knowledge has facilitated the development of several promising breast cancer treatment vaccines that are currently under clinical investigation. And uh, okay, I guess I'm done, <laughs> but that was almost my last slide. Um, I definitely want to say that we will strive to understand, address, and eliminate factors that contribute to the higher mortality expressed by African-American females because I think there are several slides that I showed you that disparities greatly exist. So we'd like to understand more about that. Thank you.